Hey everyone, hope all is well. First things first, my hair, it's gone. Stick A 2013 was last weekend, the annual 24 hour non-stop live broadcast I do to raise money for the children's charity UNICEF. Thank you to everyone who supported it, to those who watched the show and to those who donated. We raised a lot of money for the children of Syria, so thank you. Today I wanted to talk about one of my heroes. Now my heroes are individuals who have really broadened my horizons, allowed me to look at the bigger picture in life, and thus inspired some of the content I put on this YouTube channel. And Jeremy Scahill is one of them. He's an investigative journalist who has just released a movie this year called Dirty Wars. It actually premieres in the UK today. I urge everyone to go and see it. It's such an important movie. And I was lucky enough to sit down with him and chat about the movie and investigative journalism as a whole. So I wanted to share that experience with you right now. Thanks. So joining me right now is Jeremy Scahill, investigative journalist, the man behind Dirty Wars. My first question is, in a minute, for people that um, haven't seen it yet and maybe aren't familiar with your work, why should people see this? I mean, we're, we're living in a moment here where a guy who won the Nobel Peace Prize and is a constitutional lawyer by training and campaigned for the presidency of the United States on a pledge to basically erase everything that Bush and Cheney did to screw up the world, um, is presiding over what is effectively a global assassination program and is trying to argue that not only the United States has a right to do this, but is right in doing it. So our film tells the human stories of the people who live on the other side of America's missiles and raises very serious questions about the possibility of this coming back around as a boomerang to hit us all in Western society. And this is your first film? Um, probably my only film. Uh, oh, know. really? Well, I don't I mean, yeah, I wasn't, yeah. I'm not a filmmaker. You know, it was a, it was, it was a, it was a strange thing. I mean, we didn't start off to make a film. We were, we were trying to examine uh, sort of this, the idea that there were two wars in Afghanistan, a you know, conventional war that we would see on TV, yes. and then a more covert war, and it, we weren't even sure it was going to become a film. So, right. I mean, I'm not a filmmaker. Maybe I'll do something else in film, but it's not, well, it's, not on my It's always right like now. planting the seeds, and then you learn, right. and then yeah. you might do it yeah. again. Because I was going to ask how you found it differed, because as, as a viewer seeing the film, I've, I followed your work, and I'm, I feel like I'm quite well read on the subject, but the movie just hits you in ways that books and interviews don't because you're hearing the voices um, from the people that yeah. it actually affects. And, and me being a video blogger, the thing I, I really campaign against is the fact that I believe the internet is a vehicle for massaging global empathy. It's mm. the fact that when you go to war with another country, it's now not with some strangers, it's friends or families. Um, during the recent um, uprising in Turkey, I was speaking to people on Twitter and it's it's really that next extra edge. So I wondered if that would maybe be a reason for oh, continuing I mean, I, filmmaking. I completely or, agree yeah. with you. I mean, that that's part of, if you, I would invite you someday, you can come and sit on my couch in in, uh, in New York and we'll watch cable television in, in the US. We'll get some good food, we'll sit there <laughs> and we'll watch it for the entire day. And you will get a sense of how idiotic uh, our media culture is in, in the United States. I mean, it is all about uh, crime, you know, who killed who, sex scandals, you know, Miley Cyrus twerking, yes. what real housewives are drinking, and all this shit is With on. the adverts in between. And right, oh yeah, yeah, then yeah, the yeah, 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 Sometimes the adverts are more entertaining than the actual programming. And informative. Right. But, but when it comes to covering the war, it's, there, there, you never see the face of any of the people who live on the other side of the missiles. And part of why we made this film was to humanize people that we're told are the enemy. Um, yeah, sometimes actual terrorists are killed in these attacks. But tremendous numbers of civilians have been killed. Who are those people? You know, when, when we have the, you know we have this huge problem in America of, of school shootings. You know, we're a gun addicted society, um, and and these you know children get gunned down by by these lunatics who go in and, and fire it, fire it up. When when the when those stories are covered in the media, we know the names of every kid that, that was killed, and we empathize with their families because we see them as our own. Why shouldn't we do that before we go to war in Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen or Somalia? Don't we have some moral responsibility to say, wait a minute, real people are going to die, including people that have nothing to do with terrorism. Yeah. Shouldn't we know their stories or some of their stories before we decide to go and blow them up? Absolutely. I, I realized the movie was quite stylized, so there were some aspects, I don't know if that was the right word to use, um, it definitely wasn't a bad thing, to, I, I didn't mean it in a bad way, but... Um, Even if you did, man. I <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I'm but... not going to go cry in a court. <laughs> Good, that's right. good to hear. Say um, as many critical things as you want. If you want, I'll give you my critique of the... No, go ahead. Um, but, but between certain scenes, like when you went to a different location, it would be the black and white, the, mm. the photography shots, which, which I liked. Um, when dealing with a movie like this, where it's such a, a sensitive issue, mm. but it's also about reaching out to people mm. that do need it in a digestible format, 
was that a difficult process and like was was that one of the most lengthy processes i didn't when... even want to be in this film i mean as myself um you know i i fought against it in fact I'll, I'll give you a little inside information there are some scenes where i'm <clears throat> i'm sitting in a car and we're going from one place to another and there's some tension um and 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 there is tension but what you didn't see in it is me yelling at rick the director of the film afterwards get the fucking camera out of my face because i hated it i felt like i was in some kind of a weird war version of the truman show like jim carrey movie you're like your whole life is filmed for years um but no i mean we we wanted to make a film that felt familiar to people um in in terms of the genre um as a way of of, of communicating the message effectively and you know i think of it i'm i'm from a working class family in the midwest of the united states I was thinking of like, what will my um, you know relatives who are not necessarily paying attention to this like? What kind of a movie would they want to go and see, where you could actually sneak in some real information? And so, part of why we uh, stylized it in the way that we did um, is is that we wanted to create a film that people would actually want to watch yeah. and not feel like they're you know in doing schoolwork. No, no, I agree. Yeah, or doing the knowledge. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> When it comes to sort of polls, um, and especially on US media, I'm never sure where you even make a compromise with all of them. But I, I don't know if you would agree with this, that about 60% of um, Americans support the drone program. That, that's the number that seems to <clears> be <throat> Yeah, sometimes it's out. more than that, actually, okay. and sometimes a little bit less. I mean, it, but it, yeah, let's say, let's say that it's more than half. Uh, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's fair to say. Um, what, I think, what I think is at play there is that because President Obama is running the drone wars, a lot of liberals have sort of checked their consciences at the uh, at the coat check of his presidency, and they're going to have a tough time finding them the next time a Republican is in office. So, I mean, I, th I think in a way, I think you would see a lot lower numbers of support in the polls if a Republican was president. You know, in fact, uh, most liberal, self-identified liberal Democrats support the drone program. Yeah, it's it's well, there's a rising tide of voices from the libertarian movement, the Tea Party, from sort of the right flank of American politics opposing these policies. Primarily because Obama's the president, so it's it's very polarized. It's scary when you look at actually the um, polarization of what is left wing anymore. Um, no, because I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's fake. I, I mean, uh, the liberal Democrats, so not yeah. Labour or Conservatives. The leader um, Nick Clegg, who yeah. is in, with the Conservatives at the moment, he was the one that ordered the destruction of the Guardian laptops. Right. Which I hear that, and it's the Liberal Democrats, you know, right. and it, it just it really shatters the myths of these labels and the fact that actually you should judge on individual actions and individual policies. Well, look, I mean, yeah, I mean, and I followed that. I mean, they're just the, the, the idea of someone actually taking a hammer to a hard drive yeah. is sort of like, wow, mind blowing. Um, but look, look at what ha look what's happening in the, in the US right now. You know, Obama is perceived as this liberal constitutional lawyer. His administration is waging a war against whistleblowers. His administration is waging a war against journalism. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you know, Chelsea Manning, uh, formerly Bradley Manning, is you know rotting away in prison right now for blowing the whistle on war crimes. Yeah. Uh, you know, Edward Snowden is in exile in Moscow, and the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, had to actually say, "We promise not to give him the death penalty if you return him to us." And they're ruining the careers of anyone who speaks up or speaks to journalists um, about violations of. Uh, the Constitution or violations of people's civil liberties. This isn't Bush and Cheney. We expect that from them. This is Obama. Record number of prosecutions under the Espionage Act. Double of every president combined. Yeah, Pro right. Pro yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the Espionage Act, I mean, a lot of people don't know this. It was passed in 1917 uh, to go after people who were collaborators with the Germans. I mean, and now they're using it against government servants who are blowing the whistle, including internally, not going to journalists, but saying up their chain of command, these are uh, abuses of our rights. They're, yeah. they're going after them and ruining them. Definitely. So I feel there's a real race in society at the moment, whether it's technology or civil liberties, the internet, um, the, the race between the awakening of the global population to what's going on, so you could say with the NSA yeah. and also with the drone programs, and how far ahead the government are, where can they install it in place right. before... Um, people catch on and then it's too late. Right. What is your view of sort of the future? Do, do you feel, um, not just the American people, but around the world that we're comfortably drowning right now and just accepting it? Or do you think there is hope in us chasing it up? And Because and, and, I know the domestic... I mean, cyber problems, activism is, yeah. is amazing. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that, you know, WikiLeaks uh, really contributed to was, uh, was building an actual sort of cyber movement of... It's primarily young people 
who are trying to figure out every way possible to secure our data yes. and to protect our privacy. I admire a lot of, uh, of young people in the hacking community who are, you know, who are actually um, trying to figure out systema systematic ways to defend our privacy against governments and corporations yes. trying to seize our data. Um, and and you know you have WikiLeaks, you have the Edward Snowden stuff, you have the uh, the hacker movements. Look in the United States, Jeremy Hammond, um, you know who was involved with the Stratfor leak, he's he's going to be doing ten years in prison. It's a it's a massive injustice. The journalist Barrett Brown remains behind bars. I mean these these people are heroes, not criminals. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, um, some of the greatest freedom fighters of our generation are going to be people who are anonymous individuals on the internet. Yeah. And there's something that's intriguing and exciting uh, about all of that. All of us have to sort of, you know, we have to learn how to use high-end encryption. We have to figure out how to browse anonymously. It, it's about protecting our sources too, as much as it is about protecting our own data. So in the movie, there, there was clips of when you've been on the mainstream media and sort of the reaction you yeah. get. And I, I've loved all the interviews in which you've pretty much given them a truth on a plate and, and they've most of the time pushed it away. But Obviously, there is a real information war going on. Um, I feel a part of that information war is using language as a weapon. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that. And I know in the movie you, t you touched about uh, signature strikes, mm -hmm. and if you maybe could explain what that is, because it's clearly yeah. not what. Right. There are two. Yeah. There are two. Well, first of all, on 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 the issue of the media, I'm, I'm always surprised when I get invited back on those yeah. shows. I mean. Uh, you know, I, I went on, uh, we have this network MSNBC in, in the United States, and it's basically like state media for the White House. And, yeah. um, you know, I blast them uh, um, on their own airwaves and attack uh, famous hosts of their shows on their own programs. Five of them at once, I I'm believe. Always, or was it four it looked like them? the Brady, the Brady Bunch, Bunch, right? Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I was in the middle <laughs> and it was a strange sort of thing. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, no, but on the issue of language, uh, you know, I mean, Orwell's 1984 was a fantastic sort of illustration of the way, uh, you know, taken to its extreme, that Big Brother will sort of teach us that war is peace and, and all of these things. Well, uh, in, the, in the sort of age of Obama, um, you know, they're developing this thing called the disposition matrix, uh, which is basically like an algorithm for determining who's going to live or die in the future from at the hands of American drone strikes. Um, there are two kinds of drone strikes, signature strikes and personality strikes. Personality strike would be they know who you are, they're following you around, they get you in an open field and boom, they kill you and they know that the person that they've killed is you. Um, a signature strike is where they're tracking your metadata and they're trying to figure out who are you on the phone with? Where has your phone been? Where are you logging on um, you know, to the internet? Um, who are you in touch with? And are you with other people who fit a pattern that we think indicates you might be involved with terrorist activity? We don't necessarily know your identity, but we know you fit the pattern of what we believe terrorists are doing in a certain area. And we're, we decide that you just need to be taken out because you probably are a terrorist. It's it's sort of like the you know Minority Report stuff with Tom Cruise, where you basically say um, it's pre-crime and and we're 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 preemptively killing people, primarily military-aged males. That's another phrase that they yeah. use in the U.S. military-aged male, um, in in an attempt to preempt terrorist activities. And it is utterly gratuitous. It's the most offensive part of the drone program to me. Is that you you. You are intending to kill specific people whose identities you don't know and against whom you may have no evidence that they're involved in terrorism. And it's a language like collateral murder, yeah, which disgusts me. Well, collateral murder... Uh, is, or collateral is, damage, well, sorry. Yeah. Well, no, but yeah, that's yeah, part of yeah, why yeah, WikiLeaks yeah. called the collateral murder yeah. is, you know, they, they because it's not collateral damage. When you're killing, you know, civilians, the idea that it's, we say casualties and collateral damage, those are deeply offensive terms. So since the movie, because it's been out in the US for, since June, since June, yeah. um, what has been the biggest lesson? Have you, what have you learned from it? Maybe from the response to people. You know, I mean, I was, I was really. Um, first of all, it was very positively received in the sort of industry press in the film world, which was a new world to me. I had never been on any kind of a red carpet with women wearing big furs. And saying, <laughs> it was sort of a strange, strange thing. Um, no, the most bizarre thing that happened was um, uh, in Washington, D.C., there were people who worked for the CIA that came to the screening, you know, the opening. Wow. Um, I mean, I didn't invite them. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't hang out with people from the CIA, but... Um, <laughs> They came up to me afterwards, a group of CIA analysts who work on the counterterrorism program and said, you know, I agree with the big T, the capital T truth of what you're saying. Like we we see this and we we think, you know, we're going to pay a price for it later. But we get bombarded by politicians with all of these requests to take people out, you know. And so, I mean, anyway, the, the point is that there it was it's 
I think that there's more of a dialogue going on behind the scenes than we are aware of because people are afraid to talk. They're afraid they're going to get hit with the yeah. Espionage yeah. Act charges. With what you just said then, the, the, I always find it's it's hard to sort of put the finger of blame and it's not a blame game yeah. of is the issue systemic, is it bad foreign policy or is it individual people? And I think it's always easy to point and say, Obama's evil and, and so... No, but, no, I don't even no, think no, Obama's evil. It's a, yeah. No, I get your... Yeah, it's yeah, a great yeah, yeah. question. Because yeah. the question always is when Obama makes these decisions, who's putting the info on his desk? Is it yeah. the military saying, we need this amount of budget right. extended or else there'll be another terrorist attack? Right. Do you want to be that president who says no and then if something happens... Right. Um, it, the, the, only, the only beneficiaries of these policies of the so-called war on terror have been big corporations. The you know the um, Halliburtons of the world, the Lockheed Martins, Boeing's, Bechtel's, Blackwaters, uh, they're the only people that have won anything from this. You didn't win anything from it. I didn't. The average Yemeni, Pakistani, Afghan didn't get anything from this. Um, but to directly answer your question, the in the U.S. and I think it's true also in Britain. In the U.S., there is a beast that is the national security state, and that beast will outlast any political leader. It, will out, it outlasted Bush and Cheney, it will outlast Obama, and that beast is, uh, is alive because America's political system is totally bought and paid for by corporations. You have, it's a legalized form of corruption in the U.S. is, is what our electoral system is. And so if, if that's the reality, no one will ever become president of the United States who is not purchased by a corporation. Every year we break a record for how much it costs to purchase the White House. And he's, and he's also... Um passed a bill so there's unlimited spending oh it's, i mean it's, and now you know corporations are officially recognized as people in the united states so there's, a, yeah. there's a, a, a ruling called citizens united so that means that ordinary people who have maybe a hundred dollars to spend contributing to a politician because they believe in them they, they can't stand up against a huge corporation that that already has purchased 90 percent of that politician so uh you know it's it's not about obama it's not about bush and cheney there is a national security state that that largely exists in secret and serves the interests of major corporations. And, um, you know, so how do you confront that? I mean, that's, we need to wake up. I mean, it's not, this isn't about just who we elect. This is about getting corporations out of our lives, you yeah. know, out of our political lives. I feel that the, one of the ways we can help is with stuff like this, because the thing that's priceless I found is truth, because you can have a, a multi-billion pound news organization, but it takes one citizen journalist with a camera to record the truth and to go online, and it can completely overwrite it for the most part yeah. i'm not saying it's just that's well, it this, this morning yeah. i was reading I, before i came to talk to you i was reading in the paper an article about microsoft now saying that they're going to they're, they're looking at encrypting all of their uh all of their services um a, a, in a direct response to what edward snowden revealed by right. uh, leaking these documents to glenn greenwald and, and laura poitras um you know glenn who's a friend of mine and i'm, I'm working with him now uh he always says courage breeds courage and, and I think that that's true of what Edward Snowden did. It's true of what uh, Chelsea Manning did. Uh, other people may be afraid to speak out for fear that they're going to get locked up or live in exile. But I think a lot of people will see that and say, you know, I want to be like that. Yes. You know, or that's the example. So I, and I think you're right about okay. that. Final two questions are more personal ones, but I think ones that will benefit anyone watching. The first one is, how do you research? And when I ask that, I, I literally mean, what is the process? Right. Because even I, I like to feel that I'm quite good at reading up. I make notes of videos I watch online. Um, I'm starting to build folders, but just what is your etiquette with? First with of all, as, as you can see in the uh, in the film, I actually don't know how to type. <laughs> I, I've developed my own. I use four fingers. I, I thought never... you were doing the Hollywood thing where you know they do the nope, nope. I actually <laughs> you know, we can we can if you want I can, you can watch me I type. But I will show you. I have developed my own uh, my own system, but I'm actually quite fast at it. Um, you know I. I when you're when you are investigating the U.S. government, um, it's not everything is online, and you have to learn the process of filing what are basically like mini lawsuits to get access to documents. So a large part of the research requires you to use old snail mail to apply for things. Um, I, I usually work with researchers also, um, and sometimes they'll go and dig in archives. When we were doing the book about Blackwater, um, my researcher, this guy named Garrett Ordauer, who was fantastic, went to this tiny town. Uh, where the Blackwater owner is from, and went through physically went through the archives, um, but also you know you you uh, you know you use LexisNexis, you know which is you usually can get like a friend who's at a university to give you their password for free, right? Um, you know which has a database. It's basically like a, like digitized microfiche where you can go back through through time. Um, organization though to to is the key to any kind of effective research. I mean you have to 
keep your stuff straight. It's part of the reason why I use old fashioned paper and pin things on walls. You know, you sit there and you look at the same things over and over and you always will learn something new. Right. Uh, you know, you, you by staring at it, it's like one of those things that were popular in the 90s, those pictures that just look like a bunch of pixels and if you stared at them long enough, you'd see some the tacky lion's head yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's sort of like that. You're in the matrix when you're doing this kind of research. Um, but this is what I would say to anyone doing any kind of journalism um, or reporting. Nothing is a replacement for old-fashioned going out and talking to people. That's the best research that you can do. There, there, there are you will never get more information out of someone than you will by sitting with them. Yeah. You won't get it by chatting with them. You won't get it by emailing them or texting them. Going out, getting your fingers dirty in the in the real world is the best form of research that you can do. So I've always really appreciated about what you do is, especially with issues like in Dirty Walls, where it's clearly a motive being involved with those people that you manage to stay measured and and just report the facts. I mean, I'm sure there's times... But you have ties. to have empathy. Yeah. For you. I mean, you have to have empathy for people. And I also think that the notion that journalists have to be objective is total bullshit. Objectivity is used as a code for being devoted to the official version put out by the state. Yes. You know, it's just, it's completely fabricated. Which is a huge debate at the moment. I know Glenn's been right. talking about it with the New York Times editor. and Yeah, I mean, yeah. but it's... but the, I mean, the New York Times... You know, Bill Keller of the New York Times... Uh, feels like he has some crown of objectivity yeah. that he can wear. I mean, you know, they, and I think there, there's nothing wrong with being an activist. Some of the best people in our society in the world are, are actual radical activists. Um, but they try to say, well, you're not a real journalist if you have empathy for the victims of American or British policy. That's if it. you have a slavish devotion to the state's perspective, oh, that's objective journalism. Like sometimes the truth is just true. Yeah, you know? yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So my final question yeah. is for anyone who would love to get into journalism and be an investigative journalist. Um, a lot of people tend to choose their careers in life long after they've been to university. Yeah. You studied history. Yeah. I did psychology. But I was a terrible student. So oh, I and I, I was too. Um, what is your advice, to, especially in today's day and age? I mean, I guess it's easier for people to get online and be assistant journalists, but... Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, I mean, I agree. I share your enthusiasm you expressed earlier about the sort of digital moment that we're in. I mean, it's really exciting, and it can be a force for total democratization. I mean, it's really amazing and it comes with its risks. Um, you know, what I, what I would say to people, if you really want to do this kind of reporting out in the field, don't just bounce from internship to internship or think that someone's just going to come and snatch you up one day and say, oh, you look like you have potential, go yeah. and do this. I mean, I, I, I really think that the best way to do journalism is to start doing journalism. And, you know, if I were, if I had life to do over again and I knew that I wanted to be a journalist, I think I would get a job doing something that didn't drain my brain. Um, doing deliveries or something else, save up my money enough to do three or six months in a place I wanted to report on. And whether I could get someone to hire me or not, go there and take myself seriously and give myself assignments. And even if all I'm doing is posting to my blog or Tumblr or you know tweeting from a place or sending back an email to my family and friends, taking yourself seriously as a journalist is, is the best investment that you could make. Um, and not waiting for someone to say, "Hey, now's oh, your time." Yeah, you know, I mean, that's that to me is is the best way to, to start in this. Jeremy, thank you very much for your time. Oh, great to and, meet you. And uh, I recommend anyone who's watching this to go and see this movie because it's one of the most important ones today, and we need more movies like this. Thank you. And very even much. if it's not you making them, I'm sure it will inspire lots of other people to get out there and I hope so. do the reporting. Right, thanks thanks for the work you do. Cheers. All right. hard to say when this story began. Greetings from Kabul, Afghanistan. This was supposed to be the front line in the war on terror. What's the name of this village out here? But I knew I was missing the story. There was another war, hidden in the shadows.